We'll show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Mr. Martinez, you may continue. Ma'am, you, as part of uh, this investigation, you spoke to the defendant about the events involving uh, June 4th of 2008 and her killing of Mr. Alexander, correct? Correct. And in fact, uh, one of the things that she told you with regard to that was that um, that he berated her about the camera and that he was in the shower and that when he came out, she got scared and she ran because he was chasing her, correct? That he was, that he, yes, that he was chasing her. The other thing that uh, she told you was that she grabbed the gun, she knew where the gun was, and she said that she believed that the gun was, she did not believe that the gun was loaded, correct? Correct. And finally, she talked to her about the events involving the shooting and the fact that it involved an unloaded gun and talked to her about the shooting and she said she pulled the trigger, right? Correct. And when she pulled the trigger, she indicated to you that they were both in the closet, correct? I believe so. Well, would you like to listen to your statement to refresh your recollection? Sure. Okay. Turn my, it's my cell phone that needs to be turned on. All right, let's go ahead and play it so that you can listen. Okay. And she gets the gun anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And then she decides to pull the trigger, right? You know, I think when you're in that state... No, 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 I'm not asking you what you think. I'm asking you what happened, okay? Well, you're asking me to say what she thinks. No, no, I'm asking you to say what she said. She, she did. did. She said that she pulled the trigger. Okay, so she pulls the trigger, all right? And where, well, where does she say Mr. Alexander is when she pulls the trigger? That they're both in the closet. They're both in the closet, all right. According to you, when you spoke to the defendant, they were both in the closet when she pulled the trigger, correct? Correct. Part of uh, that same conversation, there was a discussion involving the knife, correct? Correct. And the knife was used to cut the throat after they engaged in this sexual encounter, correct? I think before they engaged in the <coughs> sexual encounter. All right, well then let's take a look at your notes to see if this refreshes your recollection as to when the knife was used.
take a look at uh, exhibit number 617. Yes. Those are your notes, correct? Correct. And they do reference the knife, don't they? Yes, they say. Oh, hold on. Please, please don't read it if I can have it back. Did you want me to read more than just the top paragraph? Go ahead and read everything, and then let me know when you're done. Sure that uh, she told you that the knife was used to cut the ropes uh, after he did oral sex on her, correct? That he did, he used it to cut the rope and they had sex while she was tied to the bed. And that knife was left on the nightstand, right? I'm not sure where it was. Let me show you the note. Isn't it true that she told you that the knife was left on the nightstand? Yes. Ma'am, um, we've been talking about a conversation that occurred, or at least we've talked in the past, about a conversation that occurred on May 26th of 2008 between the defendant and Mr. Alexander. Do you remember that conversation? I know there were many, not many, there was at least uh, an instant messaging conversation. Do you remember that? Yes. There was also a text messaging conversation involving that, yes. whatever it is that they talked about, correct? Yes. And May 26th of 2008 is two days before May 28th of 2008, correct? Correct. And during this conversation that they had, exhibit number 450, Mr. Alexander indicates certain things about her. He indicates that you are a sociopath. Objection as to indicate what's written. Sustained. It is written, you are a sociopath, correct? Yes. And it is also written there, you only cry for yourself. Correct. There's no reason to believe that he wasn't telling the truth there, is there? Objection, Mr. Alexander knowledge as to psychological diagnosis. Well ruled. They're, they're having a, an argument. We understand that they're having an argument, but you've told us before is that you can go behind the words. Do you, do you remember telling us that you could go behind the words involving the journal? I remember you telling me I went behind the words. Well, are you I saying? I remember, and I, they're having an argument here, so Names that are called, there's a series of names that are called. Um, I, don't, I don't know that I believe all the names that she's been called, so him calling her a sociopath is in keeping with the kind of names he calls her. What are you saying in terms of whether or not you believe what is being written here? You're the one that indicated that when you looked at the journals, you could go behind the journals, that what's written in the journal when it was... Uh, involve the defendant and tell us what was going on behind there. Can you tell us anything about what's going on behind his words when he makes or the statements are indicated 
You have never cared, for, cared out me, and you have betrayed me worse than any example I could conjure up. You are sick, and you have scammed me. I read a lot of rage behind those words. And so he's upset at her, correct? Correct. And it could be that he has a good reason to be upset with her, right? <clears throat> he could have a good reason. He just goes over the top, Mr. So the, Martinez. So the answer is yes, he could have a good reason, right? Not a good reason to say the things he says, a good reason to be angry, which is a very different thing. You don't know what he was angry about, do you? It doesn't matter what somebody's angry about if they're using a lot of vitriolic words to describe someone. That, that's a, a very different thing. It's everybody has a right to be angry. It's what you do when you get there that makes a difference. So what you're saying is that you really don't know why he was angry with regard to this conversation, right? No, I don't. And in fact, again, this conversation was two days before May 28th of 2008, correct? Correct. bottom, it reads, I don't want your apology. I want you to understand what I think of you. That's what it says, right? Correct. It also under indicates that I want you to understand how evil I think you are, correct? Yes. And then it ends it by saying, at least that box, you are the worst thing that ever happened to me, correct? Correct. And that is true in this case, isn't it? Objection. Argument. Sustained. Move to strike, please. Granted. Last question. May we We hope that, at least with regard to the journals, that you can go behind the journals and tell us what is really being said when something is written down. Right? I said that unlimited, unlimited excerpts that you gave me. I didn't say that about everything. Well, this is a limited excerpt that I'm talking to you about right here. This one on May 28th of 2008, May 26th of 2008, this very small excerpt that I'm talking to you about. You indicated, for example, in the uh, journal entry of January 24th of 2008, where the defendant said nothing of any note happened, nothing noteworthy happened. You said, well, that's not true. And you went behind the words with regard to that, didn't you? No, I didn't. Well, I did said you tell us that at that point you did believe that there had been this uh, incident of physical abuse on January 22nd of 2008? I did say that. Even though it was written that that hadn't happened? Even though it was written that that didn't happen, right. yes. You still went... The question is the mischaracterization. It was not written doesn't mean it didn't happen. On the roll. And so, ma'am, with regard to this, you are the worst thing that ever happened to me. You're not telling me that you're going to go behind that and tell us that that means something else than what is written there, are you? I'm looking at all three boxes, Mr. Ma'am, I'm not asking you about the three boxes. I'm, now look, I'm, I'm looking at context, Mr. And I'm Mr. not asking you to look Martinez. at the three boxes. Can you just look? One at a time. One at a time. Mr. Martinez, finish your question. Ms. LaViolette, wait for a response. I'm asking you to look at the one box only. Do you understand that? I understand that. And with regard to that one box, and that one box only, and with regard to the statement, you are the worst thing that ever happened to me. You're not going to tell me that you can go behind that and tell me that there's a different meaning to that phrase, are you? Well, negative. Overruled. You may answer. I'm going to tell you that I can't Object take one box and make an assessment on Objection, it. Objection, non-responsive. Well, the answer is stand. I don't have any other questions, though. All right, redirect. You may.
Good afternoon, Ms. Violet. Good afternoon, Ms. Wilmot. Did you just say it was okay to proceed? I did. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. I want to start with a. We're going to go back to some of the things that the prosecutor talked to you about. Uh, one of the things that he asked you about is whether or not the battered women syndrome, the fact that women can react differently than other people because they have been battered over a period of time. You were, he was talking to you about battered women syndrome and how it's not a diagnosis in the DSM-4. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. So the implication seems to be that if it's not a diagnosis in the DSM-4, that somehow men don't beat women. Do you think that's true? No, it's not true. The fact that it's not, that battered women's syndrome is not contained in the DSM-4, does that in any way take away from your um, experience and what you've seen and your education and what you've learned about battered women? No, it does not. And can you explain to us why uh, it would not be contained in the DSM-4? Or the history behind it? Initial. Sustained. Do you have an understanding as to whether or not battered women's syndrome uh, attempted to be in the DSM-4 at some point? There was a, a time when... Do you have an understanding of that? I have, a limited, that? I have a limited understanding of it. I okay. have a, a limited understanding. And in your work, do you refer to the DSM-4? In general, I don't refer to the DSM-4 unless I'm using it for, for clients who need to um, have... Uh, have a description on their insurance forms, and uh, a lot of therapists, I mean, we use it, we look at it, we reference it. That's what I mean. But it's basically used, um, also the diagnoses are used to enable people to collect on their insurance. Okay, so you're familiar with the DSM-4 in that sense, right? Yes. And do you have an understanding, then, about battered women's syndrome not being in the DSM-4? Section I just laid it. O overruled. Can you answer yes or no? I just know that it isn't. Okay. All right. Then with battered women's syndrome, is this something that, um, I guess because it's not in the DSM-4, is it something that is just made up? No, it isn't. Tell it's, me why not. Uh, because there's been a history at this point of looking at the conditions, much like we looked at uh, crimes of passion. Now, it's, it's seen as an explanation for why somebody might behave the, the way that they behave. And so it's been used in court over... Yes, you may. Women who have suffered from battering, from their partner abusing them, as part of battered women's syndrome, do those women act differently or behave differently than someone who has not been continually abused? Yes. And is that what battered women's syndrome has to do with? It is. And is there a time that when battered... Was there a time that, that battered, window, battered women's syndrome was thought, was not really worked with very much, not thought of? Yes, up until actually um, about the mid-90s. And have there been studies done to help understand why this happens, why there is this phenomenon of people who have been battered 
and abused, why they act differently than somebody who has not been battered and abused. There's numerous studies and numerous books. Okay, and so numerous studies and numerous books and is and because there are these studies and books, um, is that what has added to the knowledge about battered women's syndrome? Yes, that and the voices of battered women who've been interviewed over time, over the last, uh, I don't know, since the mid-70s when actually people started talking about it at all. Okay. Uh, you were talking about your continuum. <coughs> Now the continuum that you created or were, took part in creating, and I'm showing you exhibit number 558, at the top it has exacerbating factors, right? Correct. And what does that mean? That means factors that can uh, make one, uh, one sort of uh, abusive kind of behavior more extreme. Okay. And so when we talk about family of origin, what does that mean with regard to exacerbating factors? That what you grow up in, what your, your family's like, is like the Columbia School of Emotions. Basically, it's where you learn about who you are. It's where you learn about how to treat other people. And um, that they have those, those parents or those guardians or whoever raised you have a, an incredible impact on what you do later. And in fact, most of us uh, who have children would be able to say that, that. Relevance to her specific situation. Next question. Judge, I would like her to finish her answer. Question, and she can finish what she's saying. Okay, in fact, you were saying something about ch their children? That when we grow up and we have our own children, that oftentimes what happens is things that we say that we would never say or do, uh, we do sort of by rote because we grew up with that. It's almost an emotional reflex. And so what happens when, is there, is there a difference between, um, or a correlation, I guess, between somebody who comes from a severely abusive home versus somebody who comes from uh, a home that has some abuse in it? Yes. What's the correlation? What do you see? Well, in the research um, by Amy Holdsworth, Monroe, and Gregory Stewart, um, and also in the anecdotal research that we have with people who do the work, the people who come from the worst kinds of violence in their families of origin tend to be the people who have the hardest time dealing in intimate relationships and can be the most abusive. There tends to be a positive correlation. That's not always true but it tends to be more true, particularly if the person hasn't ever gotten help or any intervention for it. So, and I think you just touched on this, does that mean that just because a person grows up in an abusive family home that they will turn out to be in a, a batterer themselves? Not necessarily. Okay, but if they grow up in an abusive family home, the more abusive it is, the more, the more difficult it is for that person to overcome the abuse that they suffered as a child? Correct. You were asked questions about uh, Miss Arias's childhood. Do you remember that? Yes. And uh, questions about uh, her father and some of the some of the hitting that went on with her mother to to Jody, right? Yes. Uh, what? How? Can you draw a comparison for us as to what you know based on what you've read from Mr. Alexander's words about his childhood? Objection. Beyond the scope. According to Mr. Alexander's book and uh, emails from his friends Sky and Chris Hughes, Mr. Alexander came from a very abusive family that not only included extreme physical abuse, but parents who were addicted to meth, parents who were extremely neglectful to him and his siblings parents who were violent with each other, and in fact, uh, a mother who 
had, <coughs> according to Mr. Alexander. Objection, hearsay. Sustained. Were you going to, Judge, I don't, there was no hearsay. May we approach? You may. May continue. Ms. Violet, without telling us specifically what uh, words were spoken, did you get an impression from what Mr. Alexander said about how, how his mother verbally treated them? Yes. And what was that impression? That it was extremely verbally abusive, words strung together that you wouldn't hear on the street, and that it was particularly directed at him and his sisters. You were asked questions about uh, the fact that you don't have a PhD, right? Yes, yes. And in fact, I think the question was posed to you that you stopped your education. It, do you remember that? Yes. Um, you actually haven't stopped your education, have you? No. Tell us what education you are currently, or you've been getting. Well, as, as a marriage family therapist, you have to have 36 continuing education units every, um, every two years. And I generally get more than that. And that can be on a variety of things. And as a person who works in domestic violence uh, with perpetrators, I have to have 16 continuing education units every year that um, reflect at least eight hours on domestic violence and eight hours um, on a field that, that connects with domestic violence. So um, it winds up being that they can be over overlapping, so you don't have to get 16 plus 18 every year, but this year I have about 50, I think. 50, you said? 50 CEUs. All right. That's continuing education? Yes. And besides that, uh, what about the, you were also asked questions about whether or not you were really just a counselor, right? Yes. Uh, do you counsel people? Yes, I do. Are you proud to counsel people? Yeah. <laughs> what about... Uh, but do you have a license to do what you do? I do have a license. I have a, what's called a marriage family therapy license. Um, it's also called psychotherapist. Uh, it can be different in different states. Um, there are some states that call uh, folks with a master's degree counselors, and they have a license. It's, it's different in different states. All right. What does it take to get that license? Um, it takes, uh, you have to do 3,000 um, 3,000 hours of supervised, um, supervised counseling. Uh, that can include your own counseling as well. Um, when I took the test, you had to take a four-hour oral exam, and then you had to do an oral, uh, I'm sorry, a four-hour written exam, and then an oral exam that at that time included um, uh, a case that they gave you that was sort of spontaneously put to you where you had to tell them how you would handle the case. And then you had to bring your own case um, and describe a case you'd worked on and how you'd handled it. All right. And does that, getting a license, is that, is that different than um, being a counselor? Yes. Beca and is it because you have to get this license? Yes. And all the time that you have to put into to get it? Yes. And how long have you had this license? Since 1992. You also uh, were asked questions about testing, right? Psychological testing? Correct. And I think it's been pretty clear. Do you ever, do you ever give psychological tests? No, I don't. Have you ever in the past? 
Yes, when I was an undergraduate at the Veterans Hospital. Okay. And so what, what year was that? 1968, 1969. Okay. So is that, you don't do that anymore, right? No, you're, you're not allowed to do it unless you have a specialty, but because I was a, a student and that was part of my training, they actually trained me to give several tests and to score several tests back at that time. Once I graduated, I could no longer do it. All right. And uh, do you work with uh, doctors who do give these types of tests? I have consulted on um, particularly child custody evaluations where the tests are given and we read over the tests together, but I'm not an expert on testing. All right. With regard to the testing, you had said uh, in answer to one of the questions that the state asked you or the prosecutor asked you that psychological tests are subjective. Do you remember that? There's a subjectivity to them, yes. What do you mean? Well, depending on the tests that are given, for instance, a lot of people have heard of the Rorschach ink block test, and that's a, a test where you see ink blots and you kind of describe what's, what's there. And common answers are listed and you're kind of scored according to that. So I, I would consider that subjective, or yeah, subjective. The um, Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, the MMPI, is given to lots of people. If you're test smart, you know how to do it. There's a faking score on it, but, but a lot of people are, take that test and, and have some test wiseness and are able to do it. In addition, when you look at, for instance, in child custody evaluations, there's a caveat that says um, this test could be um, given, this could be the result of a normal person under stress or somebody who's really, you know, wacky. So, so there are caveats with the test and caveats that basically say the testing shouldn't be done on, just on its own, that you want the, the, the rest of that clinical interview and corroborative data with it. Uh, and do you remember being asked questions about your CV? Yes. Uh, do you know offhand how, how long your CV is? How many pages? It's over 20, but I don't know how long, and it's not completely up to date. Okay. You were just shown one piece of pa one page of your CV. Do you remember that? Yes. And it was in conjunction with talking about whether or not you were a keynote speaker or a featured speaker. Yes. And that was the only thing that you were re asked about with regard to your CV, right? Correct. And with regard to whether or not you were a keynote speaker or whether you were not a featured speaker, um, is, is one more important than the other? Well, a keynote speaker is somebody at a conference that sort of is supposed to energize the group either in the morning, sometimes it happens in the morning, sometimes it happens at lunch, sometimes there's one at the end of the day too, sometimes there are numerous keynote speakers, but the keynote speaker has a lot of responsibility because they have a short time to speak and they're supposed to get the group going with that keynote. So it's an important, it's you know considered a coup to, to be a keynote speaker. Okay, what about a featured speaker? Featured speaker, um, the difference is when I'm a featured speaker, I can be speaking for two days and I might be the, I might be the only speaker or I might be featured as a speaker in a conference, something like that. So it's really important. You could be the only person that's speaking, um, but it's different in terms of responsibility and also as a featured speaker, you get more time. Whereas a keynote speaker, you usually get anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. All right. With the line of questioning with regard to the keynote speaker or a featured speaker, there's the implication that you were somehow not being truthful by listing a Snow White, um, a, a talk about, not about Snow White, but is Snow White a Battered Woman, the title of the talk, uh, whether or not that should have been listed in the keynote versus featured speaker. Is there any, do you have any concerns that you were not honest about where that should have been noted? No. And that was the only thing that was talked to you about your CV? Yes. When I want to talk to you about the, some of the 
questions you had with regard to how you assess domestic violence relationships, okay? Okay. Uh, there was a lot of questions about that. Let's talk about um, patterns. All right. And what patterns mean to you in your assessment of relationships? Well, when you're dealing with domestic violence, you're not dealing with isolated acts. You're dealing with acts that occur over time. They can increase in frequency and intensity. Uh, sometimes they don't. Sometimes there's sort of a, a leveling off and people just use about the same level. But the, the general pattern is that over time they increase in intensity and frequency. And that what you want to look at is the mood that's created in that, in that relationship. That, for instance, if you were depressed, and even if you were depressed for um, a week, and somebody said to you, how did you feel during that period of time? You might say, depressed, even though you had a good day, or you had a good period of time. So the idea is that over time, in domestic violence, it creates a mood in this relationship. And the mood um, tends to have apprehension in it. It um, tends to have a certain amount of oppression. Um, and so people are greatly affected in this, in this kind of situation. And it, and it doesn't have to be physical. Uh, it can be verbal, emotional, you know, kinds of things that happen. But what we usually think of in regard to domestic violence is physical abuse. But I talk to so many people who are psychologically abused and talk about that as being one of the worst things that can happen to them talk about the control, the way they feel controlled, and talk about the way that's minimized next to physical abuse, because most of media portrayals are about severe physical abuse and don't take as much of a look at psychological and verbal abuse. Much of the questions that you were asked uh, by the prosecutor wanted you to look at just one statement or one specific act. Is that useful to you, to just look at one statement and then make an assessment based off of one, one thing, one statement or one uh, act? I can't do that because any of us could have a bad day. Any of us could have a time where we said something that wasn't very kind to somebody we loved. Um, you really have to look at more of a bigger picture where that goes. Uh. All right. You were asked questions about um, the women that Mr. Alexander was communicating with being vulnerable. Do you remember yes. that? Yes. So talking about patterns, did you see a pattern with regard to this? Yes, I did. What kind of pattern is it? That in general, these women were either married, so they would be considered in some way cheating, Based on the content of the instant messages that you read? Right. Or text messages? They were much younger than Mr. Alexander. They were single parents. They were um, Mormon women who certainly wouldn't want to be seen as less than, than chaste or admirable. And in addition to that, um, they, were, they were women who could be pushed on and go along with it. Because the women that were pushed on, there were women who were pushed on and didn't go along with it. So they were women who were vulnerable enough to go on once they were pushed into sexual conversation, who were women that were able to be pushed in that direction. Because of, because of whatever type of vulnerability they had? Yes. What about patterns of jealousy? You were asked questions with regard to uh, patterns of jealousy versus uh, you were trying to talk about feelings of jealousy or feeling jealous. Yes. Is there a difference between a pattern of jealousy and feeling jealous? Yes. What are the differences? Feeling jealous is, is common. Most human beings have felt jealous sometime in their lives. Acting and having a pattern of jealousy, um, as I use it in domestic violence, is when that jealousy is con used to control the, p the, the person in your life, the other person in your life, so that um, you may be jealous and you might give somebody the silent treatment. 
And what they know is when they come home from visiting their friends and you don't talk to them, that, that there's something that they have to pay a price for that jealousy. Or they may be direct about it. They may tell you they don't want you spending time with somebody. Um, one of the men in my group used to interrogate his girlfriend. And he didn't like it. He didn't like that he was doing that. Um, and he worked hard to change that. And that's what I see. It's, it's jealousy that really gets in the way of your relationship with your partner or people that are potential partners. Okay. So is there a difference between uh, patterns of jealousy and the behavior that, that is following this pattern versus people just acting normally, like let, let's talk about teenagers, or when, when Miss Arias was a teenager and she, and she was dating on and off with Bobby Juarez. Okay. Do you remember being asked questions about Bobby Juarez? Yes. And when you were asked those questions, I believe some of, the, some of the talk had to do with the fact that their relationship went back and forth. They broke up, they got back together, and et cetera. Do you yes. remember that? Yes. The prosecutor asked you questions about the fact that Miss Arias called him after they broke up and then they got back together. Do you see any type of behavior like that, that that's, to call that an act of jealousy? No, I call it an act of having a hard time breaking up and I see that all the time just in regular relationships. I mean, people oftentimes have a hard time breaking up when they don't want to do it and they, they reach out and um, People do that all the time. They, they reach out to try to make contact because they're not ready to end the relationship. But once they know it means business, you see that behavior, the, the backing off of that behavior. That doesn't keep, it doesn't increase, it doesn't keep going on, it, it diminishes over time. Okay, and what about uh, the fact that she was a teenager at the time? Does that make, make any difference to you? <laughs> It makes a difference to me because I was a teenager and I think most of us know. Most teenagers uh, have not had the life experience uh, to know how to handle breakups. And so they, they don't handle them really well. And uh, we tend to be a lot more mature, immature when we're teenagers. So the way we behave around breakups, the way we behave around relationships is different. Remember at being asked questions about Matt McCartney and when they broke up? Yes. The fact that uh, Jody spoke to uh, Mr. McCart the woman that Mr. McCartney was cheating with, Bianca, right? Yes. The fact that she spoke to her, uh, does that cause you any alarms for jealousy with, from coming from Miss Arias? No. In fact, I think um, it's almost, uh, I mean, it's more mature than a lot of teenagers or young people who would not be direct, who would not go and talk to a person, who would be angry, who would you know write notes, who would do a lot of things, but certainly not go up and, and talk to the person and find out about what was going on, and, and then back off. I, I didn't read about any other or continued contact or any harassment of, Ms., uh, of Bianca. And you know what you know about this situation from what Miss Arias told you as well as what Mr. McCartney said in his interviews, is that right? Correct. A common theme that, did you hear a common theme about Miss Arias crying when she's upset? Yes. Tell me about that. Um, her previous boyfriends, and I believe there were uh, interviews when, uh, about her as a child, and I'm not remembering exactly, but her previous boyfriend said that she was a crier, that she cried. Even, um, even Mr. Alexander said she would just cry a lot. Um, so she was a, she was a crier when she got upset. Does, does crying when you're upset, does that have anything to do, does that show any type of negative uh, pattern of jealousy? I hope not. Okay. Is there anything with regard to what the prosecutor talked to you about, picking something from when she was a teenager with Mr. Juarez to picking a time when she spoke to Bianca? And then I don't think you discussed anything with um, Mr. Brewer. 
yeah. anything about those two times in her life that for you creates a pattern of jealousy? No. And is that because you're just biased and you will say whatever on behalf of Miss Arias? I don't say whatever on behalf of anybody. I turn down cases and I've turned down numerous cases during the last three months. This is not the way I earn my living. Um, I'm a therapist and a trainer and I don't take cases that I don't feel have merit. I want to talk to you about stocking, okay? All right. Give me just one second. You were asked a lot about stocking, right? Yes. Specifically right now, I just I want to talk about um, what, what it is. Can you explain what stocking is? Not as we use it in a common sense, but in a clinical sense. What does stocking mean? Stocking is a, um, a pattern of behavior that causes uh, fear um, in someone else that uh, it can be a short pattern, uh, but that it causes not only fear, but um, a reasonable person would see this as problematic. And, and you read about stalking, and stalking, once again, is not my expertise, but I've worked with people who've been stalked. And there are many ways to stalk people. You can use GPS, you can use computers, you can, uh, you can use uh, following people. You can use uh, a term called gaslighting in their homes where even moving things around. I've seen people who move things uh, in someone's home and leave their home. So there are many ways somebody can stalk. They can, uh, as in one case that I worked on, uh, put a fake bomb. Uh, that was not a real bomb, it was a fake bomb in front of his girlfriend's house. But I think what's different and what's important about stalking is that stalking frightens people. And that people who are stalked, that I know who have been stalked, have gone to, um, have gone to the police, have tried to get protective orders. Some people have moved their homes. Um, there's a lot of usually active behavior, but not a behavior to connect with their stalker. You were asked questions about instant messages between Mr. Tr Alexander and Reagan Housley. You remember that? Yes. And I think we heard today several times about Mr. Alexander claiming he was afraid. Yes. During that same conversation that he's having with Ms. Housley about claiming to be afraid, is he also joking with her? The words were extremely afraid. Is he also joking with her? Yes, he's joking with her also. And do you know that based on the words that are contained in the instant message? Yes. And some of the uh, characters that people write to, to say that they're joking, do you yes. know that based on some of the characters that are written in here? Yes. And this is all part of the same conversation he's supposedly talking about being extremely afraid. Yes. And during the time that he's having this conversation with Ms. Housley about being afraid of, stalk, of being stalked, did you look at other instant messages that were going on on that same day? He had um, foundation indicated she didn't know the date. Oh, overruled. Do you mean answer yes or no? Yes. All right. And you know that the date that the uh, uh, that the instant message between Mr. Alexander and Ms. Housley is May 19th. Does that sound right? Correct. On May 19th, after he's complaining about being stalked by Miss Arias, isn't he also instant messaging with Miss Arias that same day? Yes, he is. 
And isn't he instant messaging with Miss Arias several times that day? I don't remember how many times. I'd have to be refreshed. Okay. showing you what's been marked for identification is Exhibit 619. You can see that there's tabs on here. Are these instant messages from between Mr. Alexander and Ms. Arias? Yes. And do you see at the top, May 19th? Yes. And do you see that there are several, although they all occur on May 19th, do you see that there are different times from different starting times of these instant messages between the two? Yes. And so in other words, are they having conversations with each other on the same day that he's complaining she's stalking him? Yes. Is that behavior of somebody who is extremely afraid, does it support that verbiage at all? It doesn't seem to support that verbiage at all. What about on this very same day, is he also having instant message conversations with another woman? A woman by the name of Nicole, I believe. Yes. And so on May 19th, he's talking, as far as the evidence, the written evidence that you have in front of you, is he talking with three different women? Yes. You were asked questions about, you were asked questions about this supposed stalking behavior. Um, and we know that this instant message when he complains about it is May 19th of 2008, but and you were asked questions about some of that behavior going for mo starting months before, right? Yes. So let's, let's take a look at some of the months before, okay, to see if, if Mr. Alexander's behavior in any way supports the verbiage, okay? All right. So we talked about, I think you mentioned on January 1st, of 2008. Does Mr. Alexander send Miss Arias a text message? Yes. And does he tell her that he loves her? Yes. And then when he tells her that he loves her, does he, there, it's, he, Mr. Alexander is making the initial contact, isn't that right? Correct. And then Miss Arias responds to him? Yes. In a nice manner, doesn't she? She loves him too. Is that in any way behavior that supports being afraid of her? Not that I can figure out. Are you also aware of the fact that, that he took her to have a soup pie on a trip with him in September of 2007? Do you remember that? Yes. And did they take another trip together in November of 2007 to New Mexico? Yes, they did. Is that behavior suggestive that Mr. Alexander is somehow afraid of her? No, that does not suggest he is afraid of her. Throughout the written items that you have with regard to text messages and instant, uh, instant messages, and let's for a second, we'll just forget about the journals that you have from Miss Arias, okay? All right. Just these conversations that you have between Mr. Alexander and Ms. Arias, is there a constant line of communication between them from, that you know of from the time the text messages start, from the time that you have evidence of the text messages from December of 2007 up till June 2008? Is there a constant line of communication between the two? Yes, there is. And is that consistent with what Ms. Arias told you? It's consistent with what she told me. The fact that we know that just nine days prior to May 19th, so on May 10th, 2008, did you listen to a um, 
sex tape or phone sex tape that occurred on May, that was recorded on May 10th of 2008. Yes, I did. And that tape is between Mr. Alexander and Ms. Arias, right? Correct. In fact, you were asked questions about how sometimes the spoken word can sometimes be better than just a written word, right? Yes. Do you remember that line of questioning? Yes. Well, in this sense, the spoken word, even though it's only one item of spoken words, you can listen to Mr. Alexander's voice, right? Yes, I can. And during this sex tape that he makes with her nine days prior to claiming he's afraid of her, does he sound afraid at all? Objection. Uh, characterization. The sex tape he makes with her. Uh, approach, please. Did you listen to a conversation that occurred on May 10th, 2008, between Mr. Alexander and Ms. Violet? The and conversation Ms. having to do with sex? Yes. Okay. And when you listened to that conversation, were you able to hear Mr. Alexander's words and the things that he said? Yes, I was. Were you able to hear his tone of voice? Yes. And were you certainly able to hear the content of what he was talking about? Yes. And in any of this tape that, that you listened to, does he ever sound that he, like he's afraid? No. Does he ever say anything to Jody on the tape, like, I don't want you to be near me? No. Does he ever say anything to her about, stay away from me? No. Does he ever say to her, you're stalking me, get out of my life? No. In fact, do they have a conversation about the fact that she's going to Utah? Yes. And do you remember that during the time that, they have the, that they're talking about her going to Utah, that Mr. Alexander immediately said, well, what are you going to go up there for? Yes, he did. And specifically, Miss Arias, did she ever tell him about Ryan Burns on this particular tape? No. Did she talk about just going to see friends? Yes. Because that's not taunting him, right? She's not telling him anything about other men in her, potential other men in her life, right? Not in this tape, no. Do you remember reviewing um, text messages between Miss Arias and Mr. Alexander that at one point during these text messages, Mr. Alexander is telling her, come on in, let yourself in? Yes. And that it's obvious from those messages that he's inviting her to just come in to his house? Yes, and have some guac. Guacamole? Uh-huh. Is that a yes? Yes. Is that uh, behavior typical of somebody who is afraid? of being stalked by that person? No. Do you remember reviewing text messages prior to May 19th that uh, Mr. Alexander sent specifically to Miss Arias that she was the prettiest girl he knew? Yes. And that he talked about how much he thought of her, um, not just her looks on the outside, but her looks on the inside, as well, or her, how, what she was like on the inside as well. Yes, he was comparing her to other women in the club that he was at. And was it a very um, flattering email? Yes, it was. But it, and it wasn't, was it sexual at all? No, it wasn't. So was it just a flattering email just on her personality itself? Yes. Is that something typical that someone who's afraid of her would have done? No. What about... When Miss Arias comes to his house at his beckoning on June 4th. Yes. And they fall asleep together. Do you remember that? Yes. That information? They fall asleep together and then wake up and he takes pictures of her, right? Correct. The fact that he would fall asleep and allow someone who he's supposedly afraid of 
sleep next to him. Is that typical behavior of somebody who's afraid of that person sleeping next to them? No. Oh. Would, well, and, yes. if you're talking specifically about Mr. Alexander and Mr. Alexander's fear, because when you're talking about Miss Arias, she's also sleeping next to him. And what I would say about that is that for the most part, people who are abused aren't afraid all the time. They tend to get scared when they see an indication that the other person is getting upset, either by tone of voice, by, by how they look, by their behavior, but they're not always afraid. So I wanted to clarify that. Sure, and, and does this go to, the, to some of what you were asked on cross about the difference between um, stalking behavior versus somebody who's in a domestic violence relationship? Yes. The difference between judging the two of those? Yes, okay. and, and if they're stalking in a domestic violence relationship, there's a lot of fear in that situation too. And oftentimes the stalking in a domestic violence relationship happens after the relationship ends and the person is more frightened and will go after the person. Okay. You were asked questions about their relationship, Mr. Alexander and Ms. Arias, their relationship ending in June of 2007. Do you remember that? Yes. And the characterization that their relationship was over as of June 2007. Do you remember that? Yes. Yeah. Ms. characterizes her answer as June or July of 2007. Did they break up June 29th of 2007? Objection. Yes. Okay. So the end of their relationship being June of 2007, right? Correct. After they broke up, the, the next day, was there was there contact between the two? I do not recall. Okay. Within a week of that time, do you know if there was contact? Yes, there was. Okay. And was there continuing contact after that? Yes, there was. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a 10-minute recess at this time. Please be back in the designated area at 2.45. We will start promptly at that time, 2.45. Remember the admonition, you are excused. We're in recess.